In years past in the NFL, the greatest weapon a defensive player could have over their opponents was pure fear. I mean, just think about it. Walking up to the line, what would be a bigger hurdle to overcome than staring into the crazy eyes of Mike Singletary, or the toothless grin of Jack Lambert, or the insane unhinged aggression of guys like Ray Lewis? Now, those players became famous not just for their incredible strengths on the field, but their ability to strike fear into the hearts of the opposition, sometimes by whatever means necessary. But as years have passed, the NFL has changed, mostly due to increasing concerns over concussions and overall player safety, resulting in a game that's nearly unrecognizable in comparison to football in eras that have passed. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But for Vontez Perfect, his style as a linebacker is far more compatible with those headhunting players of 50 years ago, and he hasn't allowed millions of dollars and a multitude of suspensions to change that over his career in the NFL, piling on more hatred and personal fouls with each new action on the field. So with him just now signing with the Oakland Raiders, who look to be trying to assemble a defense comparable to their own cutthroat unit of the past, today I want to take a look at how Vontez Perfect has become infamous as one of the dirtiest players in football and how his track record all throughout his career has led to him being the most widely hated player currently in the league. Before we jump into it though, I'd like to thank Manscaped for sponsoring today's video. Let me level with the guys out there, which is pretty much all of you. Now, it's crucial not to underestimate the importance of grooming not just up high, but also below the belt. And for that reason, Manscaped is the only brand out there that's 100% dedicated to making sure that when the time is right and you turn down those lights, you're not going to need to have Slash there in the room with you playing the intro to Welcome to the Jungle. Manscaped has been featured on Shark Tank for products like the Waterproof Lawn Mower 2.0, which is equipped with 6,000 RPMs of trimming ability, but also a one-of-a-kind quiet stroke technology, so you can get the job done quick without ever having it sound like you have to have a live chainsaw next to your balls, which is a nice bonus to your experience, trust me. And with skin-safe technology, you can rest assured that your family jewels will always emerge every time without a single nick or cut. If you go down to the link below and use my code STE20, you'll get 20% off your entire purchase. And not just that, but also the Shed travel bag completely free of charge, so that no matter where you are, you'll always be ready for action. So head over to manscaped.com with code STE20 today to get the very best in men's grooming. So now, let's dive right into how Vontez Perfect has quite literally fought and clawed his way from promising college prospect all the way up to NFL supervillain. Now, Perfect has always been an extremely talented linebacker, and coming out of high school, despite a few questionable plays here and there like this hit on Matt Barkley, he was a five-star prospect and received offers from a number of D1 programs. Though he originally committed to play for USC under Pete Carroll, on National Signing Day, Perfect made a switch to play for Arizona State. Despite initial concerns that he might not be academically eligible to make the team, Perfect qualified right on time and immediately started making an impact as a true freshman for the Sun Devils. He'd finish second on the team with 69 tackles, and despite the team's 4-8 finish, Burfitt would be named Pac-10 Defensive Freshman of the Year. He'd carry that momentum into his second season, hoping to turn his aggression into greater success for ASU's subpar defense. But his ferocity would often get the best of him, and in his time with the Sun Devils, his coach reported that there had never been so many fights during practice as there were due to Burfitt's ruthless aggression. By week six of his sophomore season, his personal fouls and unnecessary roughness flags and games had already gotten out of control, causing Dennis Erickson, his head coach, to bench him in order to try and get him in check. It wouldn't work for long though, as two weeks later in primetime against the number seven ranked Stanford team, Vontez would ruin any hope of an upset with two penalties late in the game to seal it away for the Cardinal. Despite a number of those boneheaded mistakes throughout the year, Burfick's talent still shined through, with a team leading 90 tackles, and he'd go on to win Pac-10 Defensive Player of the Year, along with being selected as a first-team All-American, showing that when he could control himself, he was one of the best prospects in the country. Going into the next season, Burfick was one of the top linebackers for the next year's NFL Draft if he kept up that level of play. But unfortunately, he just didn't, and a myriad of issues on and off the field caused his draft stock to start to plummet. Burfick struggled with weight issues and locker room fights, despite being billed as a team leader on the defense, even allegedly punching a fellow teammate at one point during the season. All of that mixed with major regression on the field from 90 tackles the year prior down to 68 in his junior season saw Burfick's stock in complete freefall, and he wasn't about to do himself any favors in the time leading up to the NFL Draft. His performances at the Combine and ASU's Pro Day were extremely poor as he ran the slowest 40 time of any linebacker at over 5 seconds and underwhelmed in most other drills too, serving to lower his stock even further. Face-to-face -face meetings with team GMs on the other hand were described as nothing short of disastrous. He tried to tell team after team that he wasn't the dirty player that everyone had said he was, but no one really wanted to buy it. As it turns out, they had pretty good reason not to listen. The entire draft would come and go without Vontez being selected, as while there was no doubt that his talent was there, there were far too many red flags to feel confident in taking him with any of the 256 picks available. But when it came time to scoop up players risk-free as undrafted free agents, 
Perfect received a call from the Bengals. And once he arrived, he'd fly under the radar and let his talent do the talking for the first time in a while. He led the team in tackles with 127 in his rookie season and managed to go the entire year without incurring a single fine, but rest assured, this would be the first and last time that that would happen. In week three of the following season, he'd receive his very first slap on the wrist from Goodell and company, as he was fined $31,000 in one game for an illegal hit on James Jones and an illegal hit in Ryan Taylor's groin. He'd continue to tack on personal fouls, earning nine throughout the year and six of them being unnecessary roughness. He had quickly begun to generate a bit of a reputation for himself. Earning a base salary of $480,000 in his sophomore season, Burfick managed to lose nearly $60,000 of it, all from fines incurred during the 2013 year. Nonetheless, he was still an explosive player for the Bengals, using his stellar knack for getting to the ball carrier paired with quick burst and punishing contact to earn a Pro Bowl nod for his 171 tackles that led all players in the NFL. His name was being mentioned as one of the hardest hitting linebackers in the league, but also as one of the most despised players to play against due to his cheap shot tendencies. Now I think it's safe to say that he's always been and always will be a physical defender, and I think a lot of people that vouch for Burfecht are quick to say that he's the only tough player left in a soft league. But from my view, there's a major difference between being able to control your aggression and use it to your advantage, and letting it control you. For Burfecht, he's seen the rules of the game change before his eyes, and despite a multitude of chances to alter his style of play, he's never made the effort, something that will soon become clear. After signing a contract extension heading into the following season, Burfecht would run into what would become yet another troubling part of his career, frequent concussions. Burfecht would be forced to miss his first ever NFL game after sustaining concussions in two straight weeks to open the season. When he returned in week six, the spotlight shifted away from his talent to his dirty style of play, and he'd be fined for attempting to twist the ankles of Cam Newton and Greg Olson on separate touchdowns after they'd already scored, two players who had both already suffered ankle injuries early in the season. Players across the league were outraged that this kind of action was being allowed to take place, and though he wouldn't be suspended, he wouldn't have much longer to wreak havoc each week. Perfect season would end just two weeks later, as he sustained a knee injury that would require arthroscopic surgery. Now, if you're familiar at all with Burfecht's career up to this point, the 2015 saga in the next year is likely what you remember most. After returning from injury, Burfecht would ignite a dormant rivalry with the fellow AFC North's Pittsburgh Steelers for all the wrong reasons. In week 14, with both teams close in the playoff race, Burfecht racked up three fines totaling nearly $70,000, including two unnecessary roughness calls and a low hit on Steelers quarterback Ben Roethlisberger. But that wouldn't be the last time the two teams met as a month later they'd meet again in the first round of the playoffs. As a tightly contested game was coming to a close, Burfecht had made a major impact, with his six tackles, one sack, and one interception helping the Bengals to a 16-15 lead with just 18 seconds standing between them and the divisional round. But if you thought that Burfecht could contain himself when presented with an opportunity to headhunt, then I've got some disappointing news for you. This burger from the pocket, middle of the field, incomplete. Oh, a flag does come in! Went to the head! That helmet-to-helmet -helmet hit on Antonio Brown would not only give the Steelers the necessary yards to kick a game-winning field goal, but it would knock Brown unconscious in front of all of America. It's gone down as Burfick's most infamous play to date, and as fate would have it, the Bengals haven't made it back to the playoffs since. After that game, it was pretty much unanimously agreed upon that Vontez Burfick was one of the dirtiest players and biggest scumbags in the whole league. He'd be suspended for the first three games of the 2016 season, and after a decent year that only included $77,000 in fines, his year would end in yet another concussion in Week 15. After making a full recovery from that, though, he celebrated immediately in Week 2 of the following year's preseason by delivering a blindside block on Anthony Sherman that would get him suspended five games to kick off the year. After appeal, it was reduced to three games, and after he served them all, he wasted no time in going straight back to his usual ways of kicking guys in the face and drawing personal fouls game after game. He'd even kick it up a notch with his first ejection of his career after contacting an official. In week 13 of that year though, the tables would finally be turned, and Burfecht would be the victim of a crackback block from Juju Smith-Schuster. And while I don't condone stooping down to a dirty player's level, I've gotta admit that this was pretty satisfying to watch. Injuries would keep Burfecht out of action for the next three out of four games, and while he was off the field, he managed to get hit with a four-game suspension for violating league policy on performance-enhancing drugs. With a track record like Burfecht has, it's miraculous to me that he's been able to remain on a team with so many disciplinary issues after seven seasons, because while he's certainly a talented linebacker, he definitely hasn't been able to learn from his mistakes. And when he returned to the field, he shockingly still proved to be unable to control his headhunting nature by illegally hitting running back James Conner and again leveling Antonio Brown. 
In March of 2019, after seven seasons of mostly competent linebacker play and completely incompetent decision making, Vontez Burfecht would be cut by the Cincinnati Bengals. And after having sustained seven concussions in his career, which is a massive health concern, it looked like the league might have seen the last of Burfecht's reign of terror. But that outlook would die after only a few hours. Why? Well, John Gruden. Despite having just traded for superstar wideout Antonio Brown, the Raiders would quickly pick up Burfecht and sign him to a one-year contract. While Brown and Burfecht claim that their beef is in the past and it's all business from here on out, knowing Burfecht's tendency to take cheap shots in practice from his time with the Bengals and even back in college leads me to believe that when it comes to actually reporting for work, AB won't appreciate having to line up against a man who's actually tried to kill him multiple times. But hey, I guess this is the new look Raiders that Gruden has been promising. It makes sense from a logistical standpoint, don't get me wrong, since Raiders defensive coordinator Paul Gunther has coached Burfecht since his first year in the league as a linebackers coach and later as defensive coordinator of the Bengals. But having a relationship with Gunther has never been able to solve Burfecht's dirty tendencies before, and I sincerely doubt that John Gruden is about to just change that. But I suppose if that's what the Raiders are looking to build on as an imitation of the past, that's exactly what they're going to get from their new addition at linebacker. So in terms of what's next for Vontez Burfecht in silver and black next year, I'd be expecting a lot of hard hits, but also a lot of penalty flags.